Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome back to the return of Doerisms, the podcast presented by our good friends at Advanced Physical Therapy. Our big thanks to Jason Stratton and company for helping us bring back this project. And to celebrate, we have got with us the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Matt Shuffman, the sports editor at Muddy River Sports, who's done some incredible work already. I know the project started for you on August the 16th, right. but now... You are full force in it, daily updates, great stuff, great content from Thank all you. different places. How are you able to keep all the balls in the air at this point? We're doing it. Yeah. You know, just you got to go about the business just like you do. You know, you, you go here, you go there, you get it done. We have great support, just like you do. Uh, you mentioned Advanced Physical Therapy, supporting the Durism's podcast. They're our prime supporter. You know, you check them out. Make sure you log on to our website. You'll see their, their logo. They do a great job of supporting local athletics. So the fact that they're supporting ventures like, like ours and like yours is a fantastic deal. Um, and and it's, it's that kind of support that you get from the community that allows us to do what we do. Always do business with the people who do business with your communities yep. and your kids, because I think that's a great business model. And that's the best way. You can either do business by a community or with a community. Right. And obviously, the good folks at Advance are doing business with a community. And now you can actually see us this year on the podcast, yeah, which right. I don't know if that's the best thing for all well, of you. if you cut the screen like right here. <laughs> yeah, it's good so on they that side. See, so yeah. they can see you. Oh, it's, it, you know, yeah, I mean. Yeah, I'll, I'll debate you on that one, my friend. But I, I, we, if, <laughs> I, if I was daring, I'd reach over and rub your bald head. But. <laughs> We're in the throes of it right now. We I are. Mean, we, we are one week in. And I know one of the great things that happened with the first week of high school football mm -hmm. we had a bunch of pleasant surprises no question uh mark twain was a pleasant surprise yes. clark county was a pleasant surprise matt woodworth winning his game the way that unity payson did yep. really nice surprise of those type of teams knox county with a great eight man debut we, we had three coaches make debuts and all won. that's phenomenal Isn't stuff it? that doesn't happen very often right of those surprises, yep. which one do you think has the best legs? Which one are you the most confident in, Matt? Wasn't a week one mirage. Is there one that stands out amongst those? Amongst the ones you've mentioned, the one I would probably go with would be Unity Payson because they've got a stable of backs. Yes, North Green wasn't a top-level opponent, but you look at what they did. They, they ran the ball efficiently. If you can run the ball in the WIVC, you're going to have success. But it's another WIVC team that made me take, ooh, wait a minute. And that was the way Camp Point Central came back against Carrollton. 22 points in the fourth quarter, lost Dominic Williams to an injury in the second quarter, and found a way to get through it. Now, Dominic Williams was going to be their starting running back. He is a three-year starter at safety. All-conference all starter conference. at safety. So suddenly you've got to replace him in the middle of a game. And look at what happens. Isaac Gennenbacher steps in and had a phenomenal fourth quarter, phenomenal game. And that 61-yard touchdown run to win the game was impressive because he pulled away from everybody. And people don't realize with Isaac that while he was doing that offensively, he also had a team-high 11 tackles in yeah. that game, a quarterback sack. He was a kid that Brad Dixon told us about. Right. But I don't know that we all realized the degree to which he was going to be an impact player for them. So I would agree with you that Camp Point's win was a big surprise because yes. I, I think that Carrollton team, and I got to see the first half of that game almost right. in person, yeah. I think that Carrollton team was legit. I don't think there's any question they're that good. I just think they ran out of gas in that fourth quarter, yeah. and a team that wanted it a little more, bit more found a way to do that. Well, you've got a, a team in Carrollton that's got a couple of kids who are getting looks from Division II schools. Right. You've got a lot of experience at their skill position players. So I think everybody kind of went, they're going to be good. Yeah. Um, and Central had so much to replace. Certainly a Brandon Rossmo is not easy to replace. No, not at all. But you start looking at everything else, and then you throw the injury to Dominic Williams on top of it, and you go, okay, Sterling Stotts did what you expect him to do. Nick Moore had a really nice game. Very composed. Very composed uh, and defensively made plays. And then Gavin Blewett stepping in at safety made some big plays. He's the one that forced the fumble that led to the Isaac Gennenbacher game-winning touchdown. That's an excellent point, which I, I didn't take into account, but yes. And that's the kid that ends up quote unquote, losing the quarterback battle, but ends right. up being a huge impact player for them. Because he understood it's not about him. Right. It's about the program. It's about the team. So, yes, I lose the quarterback battle. Nick Moore's going to be the quarterback. Fine. How else can I help the team? What can I do? I got to still show up every day to practice and do what coach asked me to do because you never know when he's going to need me to step in. Lo and behold, what happens? He needs him to step in, and he makes plays. I want to go a little bit 
twist this with you just a little bit sure. because I know your site had some great coverage from Mark Twain and, and the big showdown with yeah. South Callaway, which is traditionally an emo powerhouse. Correct. And, you know, I, I, I do this thing, Matt, where I, I try to force myself not to over-evaluate jamborees, okay. which I have fallen prey to because I thought <laughs> Mark Twain looked great at their jamboree in well, Hannibal. They followed and it up. They did follow it up, which doesn't happen very often. No. That is a team with a lot of power and a lot of running backs. Yes. Yeah. Well, the fact that they have experience up front is, yeah. a, is a big factor. I don't know how many coaches we talk to that remind us of that. When they have experience line, which is where Central is. You know, Central right. had experience line. They had to fill in all the gaps around them, but they had four starters back up front. So that's why you see they're able to run the ball. You look at, at other places. It, teams with experience line at the start of the season especially are a step ahead of everybody. And I think that's where Mark Twain is. Mark Twain has some guys up front, small conference guys up front, right. that, that fill that void, and, and suddenly you can see them build from that. Now they have confidence. They've got an energetic young coach who has proven he can coach at other places. Now he's home taking his own program, and he's home. You know, So he's a homegrown talent, homegrown boy. You just see all the pieces falling in place at, at the class one level. They could be a dangerous outcome come districts. They, they could, and it's more than just Landon Moss because yes. they have a lot of backs. And I know Dawson Talbot's going to stand out to a lot of people because of his size, but right. Lakota had such a great game he coming did. in. They've got athletes. Now, they don't have a lot of them, and if there's an injury, they may be more susceptible to anybody, yeah. but I really like the statement they made as well. I think so, too. And, and they're not the only one. You know, Monroe City went on the road and won a big game at St. Pius X. Um, Highland went up to Putnam, and Putnam's debuting a new turf field and everything, smoked them. Two hours away, yes. Two hours, you know, really, and had a great crowd travel. They did. So the fact that you're seeing Highland do some things like that, we had talked about that prior to the lead up of how many athletes they have. They have all those guys that, that are all state track runners, right. sprinters, and so they have speed everywhere. But then you mentioned Clark County. Clark County started getting votes in the state poll because of the way they've Progress. And that's a really young team. Yes, you know, it is. With a lot of, not a lot of known commodities coming in to win they, the way they did. You're yeah. right, that was good. Now, we, we talked about statements, and you know, I know it's the cheap, easy pop to ask you about this, <laughs> but my goodness, you walk into a defending state champion's house, nobody beats Helias at Ray Hench's stadium like mm -hmm. the way Hannibal did. And it was defensive. I mean, yeah. we, we can talk about everything else, oh, but, yeah. but they held them to 13 rushing yards. In, That's a monster performance. Incredible. Incredible. And you, and you look at how they did it. It was everybody involved. It was. And, and you can talk about the different layers to that defense. And certainly when you start talking about Hannibal's defense, because of the experience factor, you talk about the secondary with a Kaiser Greenwell, with a John Klubein, with a Markel Humphrey. You know, and you go, whoa. But then you've got an Ashton Watts at linebacker who gained incredible experience as a sophomore and as a stud. And then, and then up front, you've got guys that just get after it. You do. And, and you saw what happens with that. They've got good defensive coaches. They who do. Who put guys in the right spots and make the right calls. <laughs> and they're so athletic. I mean, think of the guys that aren't playing defense. Well, the, well, think of the fact that Tyler Hardy was like buried on the running back depth chart. Nobody would have heard of him, right. senior, but he goes out and makes the biggest play of the game with no that question. pick six interception. Yeah. And, you know, that's a but dude I, who, I don't think watch, people understand. So good. I don't think people understand how good of a linebacker he is. Yeah. Whether you could slide, you could slide him to a corner, you could slide him to a safety because of his athleticism. He is a rover. Yeah. And, and because of that, he gives them another dimension defensively. I think he, you know, we've talked so much about Hannibal. But I think he's a guy that we've hardly mentioned. And I think he's going to be a heart and soul guy for that defense. Isn't that endemic of who they are, though? You can spend yeah. time talking about one Hannibal kid, and there are five more who aren't getting enough attention, well, which is who they are. And offensively, we talk so much about Aeneas Williams and Cortland Watson. Well, look at A.J. Thomas last week, over 100 Monster yards rushing. Game. Monster yeah. game. Now, got the ball a ton. He did. He's a workhorse. But they need that kind Yo, of Oh, yes, no question. But then, did you see the catch John Klubine had for the touchdown? I mean, here's a kid who didn't play wide receiver last year. They just used him at cornerback. And look what he can do all, you know, on the offensive side of the ball. It's just, I, I don't see a weakness in them. And we've talked about that before. But, but that's a statement when, now if they can get another one this week against yeah. Jeff City, then Katie bar the door. How weird is it for us to, you, you and I who have grown up around mid-Missouri, mm -hmm. both work there, both kind of cut our teeth at the University of Missouri. Right. How weird is it to say Jefferson City Class 4 District School? 
Weird. Yeah. Weird. They're supposed to be playing Blue Springs for a state title. Right. You're supposed to have... Uh, with Pete rasping on the sidelines. Yeah. 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 And so the, it's, it's just different, but it's interesting. It is. Because we get to see them that way. We do. Mm -hmm. um, you spent your Friday night at Flynn Memorial Stadium. Yes, sir. It was one of the oddest games <laughs> that I can remember in a long time. And there was no continuity or flow to it. No. Were there, po I, I know there were positive takeaways. Yes. For you, what were those positive takeaways? First for the winners, obviously, in Notre Dame. Well, you look at what they can do special teams. Yeah. Special teams were very impressive because they, they figured out where to put guys in the right spots to make plays on special teams. So if that continues, that's a huge asset. Um, defensively, they took away everything. Really, you know, if not for the fumble <clears throat> that Notre Dame lost in the first half, they pitch a shutout in the first right. half. You know, it's, it's hard to keep a team out of the end zone when you give them the ball inside the 20. So, um, but you look at that. And I thought Calvin Lavery had poise. He did. Um, he is not an Ike Wiley. It's not going to be. He's a different quarterback. Yeah. So people got to understand that. But I thought he showed great poise. I thought he threw the ball well at times. He missed some, but that's going to happen with every high school quarterback. But I, th I thought if he can stay on the field, you know, cramps were an issue for everybody that right. night. But if he stays on the field, he runs that offense. Do you get a sense that Bob Sheffield is still trying to figure him out a little bit? Yes. Too? Like, okay, because I got that sense, and I was only there for part of the first yeah. half. But I got that sense of, okay, here's what we think he can do. And I think intentionally when they had the lead, they tried some different things with well, him. Well, they That's did. How it you, felt. you could see it. Okay. If you've been around the program, you could see it. You could see, hey, let's see if he can push the ball here. Let's see if he can make this pass here. Because you're playing with a lead. So you, you don't have to go, okay, here's what we have to do to get something done. Let's experiment a little bit. So I, I like that. I like that they, they didn't just settle in and say, okay, we got the lead. We're going to run the ball between the tackles and work the clock. They, they pressed the issue a little bit, which was good. For Quincy High School, I, th I think defensively, they're okay. They were on the field a long time. They were on the field an awful lot, but think about it. First touchdown was a, a kickoff return. It was. Second touchdown was a blocked punt. Yes. You know, they only gave up one offensive touchdown in the first half. Okay. So, and they were on the field a lot. So I, I think you look at how can they make better plays defensively? How can they get stronger? They need depth. I think depth's, a, a depth's an issue with them because when you saw when guys went out, who do you have to put in there? So you're, you're obviously nursing a quarterback situation at Quincy yeah. High, which sort of gives an artificial boost to a defense. How good is the Quincy Notre Dame defense based on what oh, you saw? Really good. Okay. Really good. Um, the fact that because of the, the cramp issues and some injury issues, they moved guys around an awful lot. And so like Zach Friedersdorf, who's, who this year has been moved from linebacker to safety, well, he ended up playing cornerback. He ended up playing linebacker. They moved him around I didn't a lot. Realize yeah. That. yeah, they moved they moved guys around a lot. Okay. on that defense, um, but they but but they're all playmakers. They're all guys that they can move around um, at the linebacker and in, in the secondary spots. So I, I think they need to get a little better up front, okay. a little better push at times. Again, they're young up front. You don't have the bookends like you've had a couple of years, the Jack Marks. Well, that, that's a generational bookend, yeah. you know, obviously. So, so th those are things you have to, to be concerned, not, not concerned with, but work on as you progress. You know, you want to have a better pass rush time and time again. I'm not sure Quincy Notre Dame is going to get tested much this week either. I don't think so at all. I'll, if you look at what happened last week, Rock Island Allman lost 62 to nothing yeah. to Davenport Assumption. They had a mass exodus from what I understand. Um, over the past year because of the COVID issues where some of the kids that Alleman was counting on moved to the Iowa schools so they could have a full year starting last fall um, and didn't have to worry about the COVID issues. So, so we've got those two games out of the gate and then Marceline, which I, I don't have a good read on yet. I have no idea at this moment. It's a really weird open to this season for Quincy it, Notre Dame. It is. So because you're playing three games in town. Two of them at your home field against, you know, one big school, one school that's your size, but is traditionally that is traditionally good, yes. but is down this year. Right. And then a Marceline team they haven't had on the schedule. That's like, okay, we've seen them in postseason against some of our Northeast Missouri schools, but how good are they? How physical will they be? You know, we're, we're going to find out. I, I think, uh, 
I think it's a good three-game start to the season for Notre Dame to let them grow. So there is that positive spin into some of those growth areas where you're yeah. going to get your reps early. And yeah, no that. question. And, and I think, well, again, because we saw that they could move guys around, because I think they need to run the ball better. I think that's, okay. that's the one thing. They threw the ball pretty well. Um, Calvin, like I said, Calvin Lavery was, was pretty poised, pretty solid, and everything he did, they got to run the ball. They're going to have to run the ball with better efficiency against better defenses. Okay. And so I think that's, you work on that the next few weeks. We are at a point now where the fall sports calendar is kind of unfurled on us in a hurry yes. outside of football. And you and I kind of felt the impact of that because as we were talking, we can't get all the places we want to get right now. <laughs> no. But we have had a chance to see some of those teams yes. and some of those teams that we thought going in. And I thought one of the most interesting teams coming back this year was Q&D Soccer yep. based on the fact that you graduate arguably the finest player you know, this, you know, at least I mean, up front. Greg Reese called Seth Anderson the best player okay, in program Okay, so that's, that's not, not unfair then. Okay, no. so at least we, best offensive player. Okay, and we saw what he's already done at St. Louis. You know, he scored a goal two games in. Yeah, you know, and, and it, was, it was what Seth Anderson does. You know, he got a great pass, went in one-on-one -on -one and buried the shot. He doesn't miss those opportunities. So, you know, you know how good he is. You don't have that level of score on the Quincy Notre Dame. Tanner Anderson's really good. He is, but he's different. He's, he's also he, very different than Seth. He Seth. is very different. The thing I've noticed about QND is they are really, really dangerous on set pieces. They are. Whether it's corner kicks, free kicks, restarts, all set pieces, they're extremely dangerous on. And they have a host of different guys initiating that, which is kind of, yeah. you know, you got it was always Mitchell Murphy a couple of years ago. He yes. was always the initiator. It's Cage Hughes. It's different guys yeah. doing it at every piece. The one who's impressed me in that sense is Brock Evans. Yes, and he's done a lot of that off the corner restarts. Yes, he has, but they've been really good corner restarts. You know, he's flighted the ball in where it needs to be. Um, and, it's, and because of the way they have guys who are stronger with one foot or the other and, and the way they kick, Cage Hughes takes them from one corner, Brock Evans takes them from the other, and both have done a great job of flighting the ball. And they've got some big kids. Tanner Anderson can get up. So Tanner Anderson wins a lot of balls there, but Logan Zanger is a big Where hit. did that growth spurt come from? I don't know, but then Quentin Hankins. Yeah. And, you know, and we've seen he's been a big physical player all his entire career. But they, I mean, something about the way they build their defense, because you look at you know, Gabe Whitaker last year. Right. You know, they always have a bruiser back there that could come up and win head balls. And, and so it doesn't surprise me that they're good off restarts. They've given up some goals. They have. Is and that that's a, a concern. process? It's, it's a process, but it's a concern. Okay. Um, because how are you giving them up? Are you letting guys get free and go one-on-one -on -one and make it tough on the keeper? Or are you letting teams they have lapses. pinball through you? No, they, they have lapses. They have lapses. And, and, that's, and I know Greg Reese will, will be addressing that um, and is addressing that. But I, that is a concern. I got a chance to watch Parker Terrell last night, Net for yep. Hannibal, and he was incredible. It's, yeah. Um, Even Greg, Greg Reese said he made a stop early in the game on Jake Hoyt. He did. That it was just, where to, how, how did he get there? He's a guy that, you know, obviously comes from a very athletic family. Yes. And we know the bloodlines there. Yes. But that gives Hannibal a little edge that they haven't had because fantastic goalkeeping. You know, they've had guys up top and they've yes. had guys who've created. Having a keeper like that who started since his freshman year mm -hmm. makes them a very different animal, doesn't it? It does. It does because it allows some of those guys up top to have the opportunity to not worry about tracking, trekking back to help out. They can say, okay, we can push forward. We've got him back there to protect us. It, that having a great goalkeeper changes the dynamic entirely. Let's talk a little volleyball because okay. we, we haven't hit that yet. Um, you know, Quincy High struggled out of the gate. Yep. Quincy Notre Dame has been pretty good out of the yes. gate considering the wins. And that unity win is a much higher value win than I think people even imagine because so unity's too. really loaded up. Yeah. Let, let's start with, you know, Abby Shrek and Emmy, Emma Hoeing just on a front line. But there have been a lot of other pieces that have well, come in. Well, and that's the thing. Okay, people will talk about the transfer. Right. And Emma Hoeing, who is very good. And, and everybody has mentioned that. Like, wow, she can really play. Abby Shrek, we know about her athleticism. We know what she can do, certainly in the middle of that cordage, you know. Um, Maggie Drew, really solid setter. They've got two liberos who can come in and, and give them great play in the back line. The one to me that is, is the difference maker right now on that team 
is Layla Hernandez Jones. Yeah. Because not only does she give you a talented right side hitter, she is happy. She's engaged. She does. You watch her. It's a great and she's point. She's smiling. Yeah. She's enjoying it. Because the, the thing was, she had talked about not playing volleyball this year and was going to try tennis. Okay. But figured out stay with volleyball. She wasn't happy being a middle. Where you all you had Abby Shrek and you have Emma Barman. And she was part of that rotation with them, but she wasn't happy in that position. So they tried her at right side and found out, look, she can be really good on the right side. And look what's happening. Just, I mean, the smiles. Watching her after, and, it, and it's not just after every hit, but you just see she is enjoying the, the play and the game so much. And it's translating into her, her effort. We have... Unity, which we touched on a little bit, that, that, that squad's loaded with what they return. Oh, you, you mean Kira Carruthers. Right. Uh, Ashlyn Austin. Ashlyn, thank you. <laughs> Who's I who, my, dude. Well, you did because she's getting looks for basketball from right. Quincy University. Um, Taylor Nichols. I mean, they, they've got plenty that they can be really dangerous. Sounds like Southeastern's. Southeastern's good. really good and, and young. really young. And, and Danny Stevens' little sister is yeah. a monster. Yeah. She can just swing it. But. Brown County is off to an amazing start, yes. and it's the Flynn sisters again. Shocking. Might, yeah, I know. Might be the most athletic wings in local basketball, yep. and yet they translate so well. I mean, there's a lot of really good volleyball. There is. We, we have, and, and I know we've touched on this a little bit, but you start looking at that, plus you take into the golf culture, which is really good. Yep. Cross country with Quincy High last night with Ficker Rosen back, and obviously Miss Schuring back again. Yep. Just, I mean, you've got, and a Delaney Strauss across the river, obviously, with what she does. Do we have more chances this fall to maybe hit at a high level with all of these different areas than we've had in some time? I think so. And, and, and I don't want to go as far as say we're going to see a ton of state champions. No, I didn't. But I think we're going to see a lot of teams and a lot of individuals go deep into the postseason, have a chance for state success. Not saying they'll win titles, but to have a strong showing on the state level competition. Um, because across the board, we it's just loaded it's just the it, and the fact that a lot of these didn't get the opportunity to do that last year this is their opportunity and it's funny talking to them because so many of them have said well we want to win this for the seniors last year who didn't get the opportunity as well as for us you know and it, it's interesting how that dynamic works but i think across the board we better be prepared for a busy October and a busy November. That's a beautiful thing, though, especially yeah. after last fall, because we were, I mean, every day we were just hoping there was a golf match or a cross-country yeah. meet, because that's all we had. And, and we talk about state championship aspirations. I think on the other side of the river, there's a couple that we better keep our eye on football-wise who could very well be playing come Thanksgiving weekend. Well, I, think it, I think it goes beyond just the obvious, too, because I do think that we, we do have some yep. of those football-wise that are starting to brew. And I'm not willing to turn the page on Palmyra yet either, yeah. just because of their situation. They get Hayes Miller back this week. They'll right. get some other key pieces back in a couple of weeks. Yep. That's a really good Hallsville team that was laying for Palmyra oh, after last yeah. year and the last two years. And you know this better than anybody. Weston King caused them more misery oh, than anybody. No. No so, doubt. so, I mean, obviously they lost out of the gate, but I, yeah. I, I have not But there's, my there's also this guy over there named Kevin Miles yes. who just seems to find a way that by come mid to late October, the Panthers are playing as well as anybody, and then they go on a run and just smack people around come the postseason. He's got a, they've got teams that have gone seven and five and then, you know, are going, going with three or four losses into the district and come out of the district as champions and then make a run. It's not, I'm not worried about Palmyra right now. I know we love to talk about Hannibal secondary and, or yeah, defensive secondary and rightfully so. <laughs> we can talk about Hannibal at any level. Yeah. But, that. but Colin Arch and Landon Smith make that Palmyra secondary pretty darn no good question. too. No question about it. And that, I think once they're healthy, once they get guys back in the spots they want to be in, um, and, and some of those younger kids get a little more experience, Palmyra could be pretty salty. I want to end with you on the college note because obviously we get a weird deal, but a great deal tomorrow afternoon with Quincy University soccer with a two o'clock kickoff yeah. of the season. That's, I, I know that's not great for fans who are working, <laughs> right. but for you and I, that's phenomenal. Oh, it's perfect. You are, you are the Quincy University soccer expert. What are we going to see this year? That's a great question. Had a, had a nice conversation with Mike Carpenter this week. Okay. I think the thing with them is they're not – top-notch scoring right now. They're not clicking offensively the way he would like. And that showed in the three exhibition games. So he's got to rely on their defense. 
They've got their, their, their keepers back in Michele Barletta. So they've got, they've got experience between the pipes. They've got some experience in the back row. Spencer Van Nest is as athletic and as strong as anybody is back there. Um, and he can rotate some guys around. So he's got some experience. But they've got to think as an 11 to defend okay. and then attack. Uh, now, they've got quality attackers. They do. And a couple of them are homegrown, and, yes. obviously. And so I think once they work out some of these kinks, they're going to be dynamic offensively. Right now, they're just not clicking. The chemistry just isn't there right through the exhibition season. But I think a, light, a flip is going to switch soon. Or, you know, and it's going to happen because when they get into teams that are Division II programs, they play Wisconsin Parkside on Thursday, and then they'll have another home game against Purdue Northwest, another 2 o'clock game next Thursday. Okay. Um, and, and I think when you see the, they're playing on their own level and then all the GLVC games, there's going to be a different mindset. When you play a Western Illinois, you're going up a D1 on the road, it's a different mindset in exhibition. When you bring in an NAI program to play against in an exhibition, it's a different mindset. Now it's, it matters. This is who we have to be. We have to worry about region rankings and all that. Every, every effort goes into that. I think you're going to see a different team. Well, this was fun as always, my friend. Oh, yeah, great. We appreciate you joining us on the podcast. And again, our thanks to Advanced Physical Therapy for making this possible. Come back. I will. Well, we'll have you. I love being here. We like having you here. <laughs> Matt Shuckman, everybody. Muddy River Sports. If you haven't checked it out yet, please do. I don't know what you're waiting for. Great stuff into the ether every Thank week. Thank you. Thank you, Matt Shuckman. And we'll be right back here with a podcast for you next week.